During the following program, look for NOVA's web markers, which lead you to more information at our website. A ballerina must have more than grace and flawless technique to be successful. She must also be abnormally thin. It is a dangerous obsession for many dancers. If they want thin, I will give them thin. And I did. I dropped more weight in two weeks than I'd ever done in my entire life. Dancer thin is not like thin on the street. We're talking about 15% below your ideal weight for height, which is basically an anorexic weight. If your career's on the line, if the roles are on the line, whether or not you reach that ideal, you will do practically anything. Starving herself for nearly a year, Katie Tracy weighed 20 pounds less than she does today. The bones in her chest began to protrude. She had developed anorexia nervosa, the deadliest of all psychiatric disorders. It was going from one extreme to the next. And people around me at the dance world, they were praising it. They were saying, gosh, you look so good. It looks nice, it, you know, you, you, you have a new body. The dance world was stunned when a member of the Boston Ballet, Heidi Gunther, died at age 22 when her heart gave out. The cause appeared to be an eating disorder. I remember always watching gymnastics and figure skating and all of these sports and having them talk about eating disorders and how thin these gymnasts have to be. And, and, and I would just think to myself, God, look at what dancers have to go through. You know, and it's kind of a dirty little secret. Nobody talks about it. Eating disorders are common in the dance world, but they are spreading as the pressure to be thin intensifies. Everybody wants to know the secret to being thin because that is... That's success, that's love, that's glory, that's power. That's a crock. Today, we are told to believe that we too can look this way if only we work hard enough at it. So there's this whole myth that everybody can achieve the impossible. And that's very damaging because if then you don't achieve this look, something is wrong with you. Additional funding for this program was provided by the McKnight Foundation and by the Corporation for Public Broadcasting and by contributions to your PBS station from viewers like you. Thank you. Aaron is 14 years old. Tormented by an irrational fear of fat, she has been starving herself for three months. Aaron. What is your reaction? Just that it's true. Can you kind of look in the mirror with your image kind of reflecting back and Kind of tell me what you see about yourself, your physical self also, when you look in the mirror. I see somebody that is fat and ugly and a disappointment. I know that this is hard mm -hmm. for you. Erin is beginning treatment at DePaul Tulane's Eating Disorders Unit in New Orleans. Her mother brought her to this specialized center after she almost died of malnutrition at a hospital near their home in Texas. She's so into being skinny, to being slim. She thinks she's fat. She's not. 
but I just think she's gonna die and she doesn't believe me. I had to tell her in the hospital, I go, Aaron, you're gonna die. Go ahead and step up. At 20% below her normal weight, Aaron has already suffered medical complications, which will only get worse without treatment. This is a very deadly illness. It's the uh, highest death rate of any psychiatric illness. Okay. Approximately half a percent of people with anorexia nervosa die every year from malnutrition or other kinds of complications. So over the course of 20 years, 10% of people with anorexia are gonna die of, from this. Prolonged starvation can cause a number of medical conditions, including dangerously low blood pressure, severe osteoporosis, damage to the kidneys and liver, and ultimately, heart failure. Erin stopped eating when her mother, who works for the military, took a job in Korea for a year. Feeling alone and abandoned, she became obsessed with her appearance. I know I would be thin and everybody would like me and, you know, I wouldn't be having to worry about, you know, my weight and all that stuff. I felt like I'd be loved more, everything. <laughs> I saw a um, Karen Carpenter movie, and that taught me a lot about how you don't have how not to eat to lose weight and stuff, the water diet and everything. So that actually is pretty much what I got from it. You know, just, I can live without eating. You know. After struggling for years with an eating disorder, Karen Carpenter died of heart failure at the age of 32. At the time of her death in 1983, most people had never heard of anorexia nervosa. But today, it's a different story. An alarming study from the Mayo Clinic shows that anorexia has been increasing by 36% every five years since the 1950s. Today, some eight million people, mainly women but some men, suffer from anorexia and bulimia a related disorder. Young women ages 15 to 24 are the most vulnerable. I had been very overweight and I had exercised and eaten right and you know my mom was so proud of me and I, it was the compliment thing and I thought I was so I'm so close to being able to model mm -hmm. and I thought well you know maybe I ought to try it you know it's okay to be a little skinny, you know, the, the camera puts on 10 pounds anyway, it won't matter. Just even the idea of, hey, I wear a number one, you know, I am the top. I saw a TV movie on bulimics. Mm -hmm. um, when I was watching, I said, wow, she, look what she's doing. She's like eating all that food, throwing up and still losing weight. And that night I went into the bathroom and I, and I started and I, I didn't think there was anything wrong with it because it's on TV and, you know, sometimes they glor make it look so glamorous to have an eating disorder. It has become a self-fulfilling prophecy. The popular television series, Friends, played on anorexic chic in an ad which was soon pulled. In some ways, we all have distorted views of what is beautiful, and the repeated exposure to a particular image teaches you to like that particular image. And we have become so used to seeing extremely thin women that we have learned to think that this is what is beautiful. The mystique of thin began with the arrival of the British model Twiggy in the late 1960s. Standing five feet, six inches tall, she weighed only 91 pounds and was dubbed Britain's top mini model. Since then, fashion models have become increasingly thinner with body weights nearly 25% less than the average American woman who weighs 140 pounds. I think there are two primary things going on right now with the cultural availability of eating disorders. First, the whole society is involved in 
um, the perfection game, all right, that we all can fix our bodies, make our bodies over. And then I think among young women, they're increasingly tuned in to a celebrity culture where the models and actresses' bodies are considerably thinner than they have ever been in the past. This is very seductive and hard for young girls to resist. This is not about illness. This is about idealized beauty and perfection of a certain type. These plus-size models are boldly challenging contemporary ideals of beauty. Ranging from size 12 to 18, they are much more in tune with the average American woman. Now a plus-size icon, Kate Dillon started out as a skinny model. I think it happens to everybody at some point where you feel one way about yourself and that your initial your intuition about who you are is that you're a good person, that you're beautiful, that you're strong, that you're capable. And then at some point, it's met with an outside force that's telling you, no, you're none of those things. And I remember getting ready for my first day of junior high, and I was sitting in my mirror putting on my electric blue mascara and my frosted pink lipstick, and, and I was thinking, I was like, yeah, I'm fine. I'm looking good, you know? And when I got to school, it was just, they were just horrible to me telling me I was fat and whether it was in PE or coming home on the bus every day they'd stand up and they would jump up and down and they would chant overweight Kate overweight Kate and I remember just like you know like sitting in the front seat I'd always wear these massive sweaters and I was sitting in the front seat and just like trying so hard not to cry because I was so embarrassed and horrified desperate to fit in Kate took extreme measures by the end of my seventh grade year, I'd lost 30 pounds and I grew like four inches and, um, and I was cool. Suddenly everyone liked me. And so what I, what my plan worked sadly and, and unfortunately, but it seems to be that that's the way the culture is. You know, you sort of, you do what they want and they'll say, cool, good. You're, you're, you're good now. Kate became not just thin, but anorexic and she caught the eye of the fashion world. Weighing 50 pounds less than what she does today, Kate's image before the camera concealed a painful inner struggle. I look beautiful. I mean, it's not like I'd, I, you would not look at that picture and see somebody who was feeling bad about themselves or see somebody who hadn't eaten in two weeks. I mean, I look at my face. My face looks so hollow. I look so, my eyes look like they're bulging out and I just look so weak. <laughs> That was the day that they told me to lose like 10 or 20 pounds, and I kind of knew that that was crazy. Like, I remember thinking, from where? Like, what has he done, 20 pounds? How am I gonna lose 20 pounds? And I remember thinking, I don't have to do this. Like, what have I been doing the last couple years? What have I been doing my whole life? A year later, Kate walked away from modeling. She was in search of a life where starvation was not the price of success. Historical images and accounts of anorexia date back hundreds of years. In the 14th century, the mystic St. Catherine of Siena starved to death at the age of 33. An extreme ascetic, her self-denial was quite different from that of most young women today. Certainly during her lifetime, she engaged in food refusal and uh, a number of other penitential acts. But her pathway into that behavior is so markedly different. It's motivated by her faith she also often gave away the food that she didn't eat. So in many respects, she's not at all like a contemporary anorectic. In the 19th century, 
It is also possible to envision middle and upper class girls who want to be very thin for a totally different set of reasons than today. They didn't want to be thin because it was sexy. They wanted to be thin because it meant that they were spiritual. It, they wanted to be thin because it meant that they had kind of conquered their carnal appetites, such as food and eating. I see the common theme in all of this is that women are using the appetite as a voice. And they're using the appetite to express different things depending upon their historical situation. Today, at least three out of every hundred girls will develop anorexia or bulimia, often in the wake of puberty. I believe there are these separation, individuation, identity formation problems that are occurring. And I think that that has to do with fears of maturity. I think that development of someone from a child into an adult, the adolescent process, has a glitch somewhere. And that the eating disorder is born out of the struggle to grow up. It's OK if you're not finished. You can work on it next But why do some girls develop eating disorders and others don't? There are a lot of precipitants. You know, it could be the parents get divorced, it could be breakup with a boyfriend, it could be any number of what may seem to be very small stresses to most people and yet for a particular girl is somehow the straw that broke the camel's back. But you won't have those onsets unless the girl already is vulnerable in some way. So simply because parents divorce doesn't mean now their daughter is going to develop an eating disorder. Those events have to sort of occur in the context of an already existing vulnerability. Erin's personality made it especially difficult for her to deal with upheavals in her life. From a biologic standpoint, we're actually finding that people with these disorders actually share some common personality traits, and that is both bulimics and anorexics tend to be people who are kind of obsessively perfectionistic, and they're concerned about doing things right. Things have to be done kind of with symmetry and exactness, um, and that they tend to be people who are what we call harm avoidant. That is that they worry about the consequences of their behavior. They don't want to do things wrong. I just like everything to be controlled, just in control. You know, it's kind of like, I don't know. I just like traffic. I hate when people try to cut in you and they're sit sitting right here and the traffic like right here and then people are right here because they're trying to get into another lane. I'm like, just keep the lane straight. That's just me. That's just how I am. Now, when we go back and we start looking at families of people who have eating disorders, we actually see a very high rate of a spectrum of eating disorders in their families. And we see that if, you know, roughly about 7% of the family members have anorexia, bulimia, nervosa, and we see roughly maybe another 5 to 7% of family members have a spectrum of eating disorders. They don't have anorexia or bulimia, but they have some variant of eating disorders. In search of a biological explanation, Dr. K peered inside the brains of recovered anorexic and bulimic patients. He discovered unusually high levels of a brain chemical called serotonin, which is well known for the role it plays in mood and appetite overactivity of the serotonin system reduces appetite. The other thing about having increased serotonergic activity is it seems to be, at least in animals and, and human studies, goes along with having kind of obsessive, uh, anxious, um, harm-avoiding kinds of behavior. Dieting, even starvation, may be a way for people with eating disorders to lower their serotonin levels in an attempt to reduce their intense anxiety. This may explain the vicious cycle that people with anorexia get in. They have too much serotonin, they starve themselves, that drives down the serotonin. But the brain quickly adapts by adding more serotonin receptors. So even a little bit of serotonin sets off these receptors. So people have to keep starving themselves more and more to reduce the serotonin, but the receptors keep upregulating so they can never really escape from it. For patients with anorexia, 
Weight gain is a crucial first step toward recovery. Okay. That's what I'm doing. About 10 minutes. Okay. Anorexia is one of the most difficult psychiatric illnesses to treat. Nearly 50% of patients will relapse within the first year. But new research shows that these rates can be dramatically reduced if patients like Aaron reach their normal weight before leaving the hospital. There is ample evidence that the lower the weight, the greater the risk of death and the greater the risk of medical complication. So I think what we ought to pay attention to in the treatment of anorexia nervosa as sort of an index of how someone's doing is the weight. And if their weight isn't back to normal, treatment isn't ended. Be doing a little bit better today. But weight gain alone is not enough. Anorexia is a complex mental and physical illness that requires a multidisciplinary team to treat it. Okay, why don't we go ahead and, and staff Aaron? Psychotherapists, a physician, nurses, art therapists, body image specialists, and nutritionists will work together to tackle Aaron's eating disorder. In order to treat eating disorders effectively, we need to address both parts of the problem. We need to address the underlying causes and issues, and we need to address the symptoms, the eating behaviors that are so dangerous. And I believe as an inpatient, people need to address these things simultaneously and address them both with a vengeance. Five weeks into her stay at the hospital, Erin is gaining weight and has begun to face some traumatic issues in her past. She admitted to having been sexually abused, not uncommon among these patients. Trauma is what really hit it off. Bringing up my trauma issues really made me want to just, I, I wanted to get rid of it somehow. The feelings, too many feelings, I was like too many feelings. Flush them down the toilet. <laughs> Having been sexually abused teaches a girl a number of things. One is that she's powerless. It's, a, it's just a horrendous experience to go through. And one way to cope with that sense of powerlessness is to try and find some way of having power and control. And by managing one's weight, that can be one way to have power and control. Some women will overeat it quite explicitly as a way of making themselves less attractive. Others will diet as a way of starving themselves into an unappealing small size. So there's sort of any number of explanations that, that women then come up with, but they all have to do with trying to cope with uh, what has been an extremely traumatic experience. Talking about the abuse marks a significant turning point in Aaron's treatment. Secrets, you don't keep secrets, you know. Secrets are bad. <laughs> And I was keeping a secret, and if I would have kept that and went home with it, I'd just gotten sick again. It's unfamiliar. Group and individual therapy are critical components of the treatment process. I just thought that I could live the rest of my life not eating, and it was like a power thing. I was like, look, Mom, I don't have to eat. I can piss you off. I don't have to eat, you know, and it works. It works. I mean, that's the last thing your parents want is for you to die. And so when you sit there and you're like, I'm not gonna eat, I'm gonna slowly kill myself, it works. You can get back at anybody. And I guess, I don't know, I guess I need to find a way to forgive her. You know, because I'm just punishing myself. I'm killing myself. And it's so stupid because you don't win. Losing your life isn't worth it, is it? It hurts her, but it hurts you more. Yeah. How does it feel to be looking at all those feelings from back when they got divorced? It just makes me mad. I'm mad because because I didn't tell them. These are not generally kids who can scream and yell and say, I hate you. Why did you do this to me? They're very sweet and they're very kind and they're parent pleasers. And so they are aggressive in the sense that they are driving the knife deeper into the family as the family watches them die. 
but they're very sweet and very kind and very quiet about the process. At age 21, Alina Malamed has also paid a heavy emotional price. A gifted dancer, she was told to lose weight at age 12. I remember having a teacher come up to me and pinch my back, pinch the skin on my back, and say, what is this? Are you drinking milk? You're, you know, you need to lose weight. Alina eliminated fat from her diet. In time, she became anorexic. My anorexic year, I call it. I was the happiest I had ever been in my life. I was getting all the good parts in our performances at the school. I was getting all of the attention. I was not being ignored anymore. When I was heavy, um, I was ignored instead of nurtured. Um, and when I was really thin, I, you know, all of a sudden was nurtured and taken care of and the teachers loved me and they cared about me. Um, it was like I was a whole new person. After starving herself for over a year, Alina lost control and began to eat. Gaining weight was, for me, the worst thing. I was just so ashamed of my body. I felt like I was the biggest failure and the weakest person, just the worst person. picking up a knife from the kitchen and starting to cut myself um, on my arms, on my legs. I had so much pain inside of me and so much hatred and animosity towards myself that feeling the pain and making it real pain as far as being able to see the blood and see the cut, um, it was calming. Um, I did that for a long time. Despite her fragile state, Alina's talent did not go unnoticed. At age 17, she was invited to join the prestigious American Ballet Theater in New York by artistic director Kevin McKenzie. But her struggles with weight would continue. All of a sudden, there's that added pressure of being on stage every day next to these amazing, beautiful dancers. And I just, I buckled. <laughs> under the pressure, I could not lose weight. It made me eat more um, because I got very depressed. I felt horrible about myself. Alina now faced one of the most difficult decisions of her life, whether to pursue her dream to be a professional dancer, no matter the personal cost. Erica Goodman made that decision many years ago, and now, at age 54, she lives with the consequences. A lifelong struggle with anorexia and severe osteoporosis. A former Joffrey ballet dancer, she is no stranger to extreme dieting practices. The scale becomes your altar. It becomes the site where you pray every morning. You pray that it'll be down another pound or another ounce or anything to show that the work that you're doing and the work is starving is working because other things in your life aren't working. 
and it's the one thing you have control over, and that is a major thing. I think that's what keeps a lot of these people in this anorexic mode. It's control. Nobody else can control that for you. Described by a critic as a treasure of her generation, Erica danced in an era when anorexia was a silent threat and all too easy to overlook. The really perverse irony of this is that what has been taken away from me are my legs. And for somebody who had always been very flexible, I'm very stiff. And it's only now that I know. It's only when you're paying for it. You're paying for it then, you see, but you don't know the cash register hasn't rung. It's ringing now. And it's not until it rings. It's like sleeping. You can have your alarm clock set, but it's not till it goes off that you're going to awaken. This tendency to diet is eating disorders. And eating disorders are too prevalent to ignore today. Dancers at the New York City Ballet attend a seminar on health issues. Anorexia and bulimia are rare among men, but increasing. I think women get more eating disorders than men because we have such a focus on our appearance. Although it's changing a little bit, men have to have the abs now and a little bit more muscle tone. But if you look at professions like jockeys, for example, or weightlifters, you'll often see a higher incidence of eating disorders because their careers are on the line based on their weight. If you don't have normal periods, you don't have this increase in peak bone mass. For women, a loss of body fat from dieting or even strenuous exercise can shut down the production of the hormone estrogen which is crucial to bone growth and menstruation. This is a total bone density scan of a healthy 25-year-old woman compared to a woman of the same age who has gone five years without menstruating. Nearly a third of her bone mass is irretrievably lost. This woman in her 30s has gone 15 years without a period, transforming her bones into that of a 70-year-old woman. As a preventive measure, the ballet offers its dancers bone density scans. Katie Tracy lost her period for nearly a year when she had anorexia. Is that your uh, dominant leg? Your stronger leg? We've been using the, the stronger leg. Are you right handed or left handed? I'm right. I'm being a woman, being an athlete, I realized that. I was susceptible to bone loss, the potential for injury, the potential for loss of reproductive abilities scared me. Dancers are at particular risk for developing osteoporosis because they do everything to exaggeration. They diet to keep their weight down. They avoid uh, foods with fat in them. And unfortunately, a lot of food with fats have calcium. And you get bones that are thin and fragile, essentially osteoporotic bone. Looks pretty good. Your um, value is... Uh, Getting help right away probably made all the difference for Katie. For a woman of 30... Her bone scan um, is normal. Somewhere between 20 and 30. Mm -hmm. Strenuous exercise can lead to another form of anorexia. In a 26-mile marathon, the finish line comes too soon for Jennifer Schmidt. At about three miles to the end of the race, I knew I was in danger with this disorder because all my thoughts were consumed with how soon am I going to get to the gym after this. Unlike most patients with anorexia, Jennifer has no issues with food. She has always eaten voraciously, but got into trouble when her workouts burned more calories than she could consume. I think my personality has a lot to do with this. I've always kind of had a perfectionist personality. It kind of runs in the family, being a little bit obsessive compulsive and, and um, very I've, I've got, I'm kind of self-critical, self-disciplined is what a lot of, how a lot of people describe me. 
our lab and other laboratories have found retrospectively that if you ask people and their parents who have developed anorexia, what were they were like when they were children, uh, a majority of them developed an anxiety disorder before they ever developed anorexia as a child, somewhere around the age of eight years old. I've always had anxiety since I was a, a little child. It's just been in different ways in different situations, but exercise was the one thing for me that could take that anxiety away. So the more I worked out, the better I felt, and then little bits wouldn't be enough. I'd have to go more, and pretty much it just spun out of control. When Jennifer's heart rate plummeted after working out, she was admitted to the eating disorders unit at Methodist Hospital in Minnesota. Her mother was grateful to have Jennifer's marathon workouts brought to a halt. Day room. Up until now, up until she's been in the hospital, there hasn't really been anything I can do. I've tried being real supportive. I've tried backing away and not having anything to do with her. I've tried to do a lot of different things to see what would work, and really nothing did work until she got in the hospital. How are you feeling about uh, where things are going? I'm feeling better still. Now that Jennifer has been hospitalized for a week, her vital signs have improved. She is taking a drug called Paxil, which helps to regulate levels of serotonin in her brain and lessen her anxiety. I haven't worked out in two weeks, and that's the longest span I've gone since I can remember, and I haven't had any anxiety at all, experienced any anxiety or obsessive thoughts since I've been on this medication. Can you take some big breaths? Drugs like Prozac or Paxil act on the serotonin system, but they are not always effective, especially in patients who are severely underweight. You just check down here for any swelling at the lower part of your back. The studies that people have done, including our own group have done to date, have not found that medications like Prozac or Prozac itself is very helpful in the treatment of anorexia nervosa. Perhaps um, one reason is that most of the trials of medications for people with anorexia nervosa have been done while they're underweight. And it may be that the effects of starvation on the brain prevent Prozac from working. But as patients gain weight, medications like Prozac appear to help them avoid a relapse. I want to live, I'm going to live, I'm going to live through this. This program has taught me that and given me the nutrients and things to start thinking clearer. And there are so many things I want to do. I'm young, I've got a whole life out in front of me and I plan to live it to its fullest. In today's image conscious world, Surveys show that 80% of women are dissatisfied with their bodies. Girls as young as 9 and 10 years old are dieting, even though they are at normal weight. Lisa dropped an amazing 48 pounds in just 12 weeks. Nothing the diet like industry is a very, very big industry. It sells the myth of transformation. If you do our product, you too can be Princess Diana. You too can marry your prince. You too can be wealthy. And it's amazing how people can suspend disbelief and, and buy into anything, you know, lose 30 pounds in five days. Again, I think it gets nurtured in a culture that values extreme thinness. And of course, underneath that is what's the basic message. The message is you're not okay the way you are. You need to be transformed. The first generation uh, and second generation of most uh, ethnic groups in America, there isn't much anorexia nervosa. And at Cornell at University, Dr. Joan Brumberg is conducting a seminar on the history of female adolescence in America. The pressure to be thin is keenly felt by these college women and is spreading across all racial and social classes. When I grew up in predominantly black neighborhoods, it just wasn't an issue. And it never affected me before I came here. And all of a sudden now, everyone's so little, you know? <laughs> And yet there is, I mean, we know now that there are eating disorders in the African-American community. These observations about cultural difference are, are really interesting, and yet everybody seems to say around this table that the pressure is pretty intense right now. 
I, I believe that very few women escape um, a battle with their bodies. I think that it's to varying degrees, but I think that many women at different points of their lives are unhappy with their bodies. I don't think there are a lot of women who could say, honestly, they love their bodies. For more than a decade, Anne Chavarro has faced a particularly difficult battle to overcome bulimia nervosa, which is characterized by binge eating and purging. Most people who develop this secretive illness are around the age of 18 and of normal weight. But the obsession with food and dieting begins earlier. In high school, it was how little you could eat in order to make it through the day, you know, and what size pants are you going to fit into, because we're all trying to lose weight. When I moved to Manhattan and my friends were actors and actresses and models, almost all of them had eating disorders. So you kind of get the hang of it and then you start reading some books, start trying to get help for your eating disorder, and in reading those books you find t techniques that work. Bulimia nervosa is a relatively new disorder medically recognized only in 1979. Certainly the behavior was well recognized for centuries or even millennia. I mean, we know the Romans were doing some strange things with, with food and vomiting uh, at the time of Christ. Um, but from a clinician's perspective, um, it was very rarely talked about. Binge eating and purging just uh, weren't um, on the radar screen until about 20 years ago. For Anne, bulimia seemed to offer a perfect solution to her conflicts over food. You realize that you can eat whatever you want and get rid of it. It's sort of like a high. Emotionally, it makes you strung out. It's almost like being on drugs. You're totally strung out. And because you're constantly depleting your body of food in between the binges, you're so lethargic, you're so tired, you're so dry, you know, drawn out that you can't do the things that you even want to do. So it becomes like a cycle. It's a cycle, you know, and you can't break out of it. Anne's life became consumed with hiding her bulimia and fighting depression, which frequently accompanies this illness. She ate enormous amounts of food and purged up to 20 times in a single day. It doesn't only hurt you, it hurts whoever is in your family that you're very close to. So your friends, it hurts all them, even though you, you do not mean to hurt them, you know. The self-loathing comes in, you start hating yourself, and then if you're, like, the types who hide it, like I used to hide it, and then it's like, it's even worse. For the past three months, Anne has been receiving treatment from Columbia Presbyterian Medical Center's Psychiatric Institute. Dr. Walsh has put Anne on Prozac, which helps with her mood and appetite by acting on the serotonin system. You're in here. For many patients with bulimia, taking Prozac helps them both feel better emotionally and gives them better control of their binge eating and vomiting. And that's, that's a fact. I mean, it's, we, it's one of the things we can now uh, take advantage of in our treatment of patients. Anne has changed her behavior dramatically, but breaking the cycle of binging and purging is like giving up an addiction. During the binge, people typically will report something changes. At least they feel numb. They're not thinking about whatever it is they were worrying about. So what, there is a, re a reward there. They don't feel good, but they feel different and they feel some relief, I think, from the distress they were experiencing. And one wonders if that isn't a critical component that keeps this behavior recurring. You've got a period of time now. In addition to medication, most people with bulimia benefit from psychotherapy. One of the best study techniques, cognitive behavior therapy, is designed to break bad eating habits and establish a healthier body image and a new approach to food. I actually had like a banana nut muffin and that was like taboo for at least two years. Unless I was gonna throw it up, I couldn't eat it. To understand more about binging, Dr. Walsh and his colleagues designed an experiment. They provided a large amount of food and allowed patients to eat whatever they wanted. The result was an average of 3,600 calories, or nearly two days' worth of food, in a single sitting. 
there is something disturbed about their satiety or satisfaction as it relates to food. It seemed to be a general disturbance in feeling satisfied with a meal, the way that you and I would just feel stuffed and stop eating from. We felt maybe they're not experiencing that sensation. Anne is participating in a study to see if her treatment has had any impact on her stomach's ability to handle food more normally. Okay, so no, I'll hold it, just like always, as quickly as you can. But Anne is given a liquid meal that is tagged with tiny amounts of radioactivity. Okay, just lay really still. This machine, a gamma counter, detects emissions from the meal and will monitor the rate at which food leaves her stomach. After food enters the normal person's stomach, small amounts begin to empty into the small intestine. This triggers the release of cholecystokinin, or CCK, a hormone that helps transmit sensations of fullness to the brain. As more CCK is released, the person starts to feel full and eventually stops eating. In the case of bulimia, it appears that over time, binging on large amounts of food causes the stomach to empty more slowly into the small intestine, so less CCK is released. The message to the brain to stop eating is weaker, so the person does not feel full and keeps eating. After three months of treatment, Anne's stomach is emptying at a more normal rate compared to three months ago. I can see that there has been an increase in her gastric emptying rate, which is what we would want to see. It's more typical of a normal control subject, a normal individual. So at least from that perspective, the gastric emptying data looked to be improved in the three month period that she received treatment. About 50% of patients who receive treatment for bulimia are cured, while the remaining half, like Anne, are substantially better. But it still may take several years before Anne fully recovers. At the American Ballet Theater, life is looking up for Elena. She admitted she had an eating disorder, and director Kevin McKenzie offered her a medical leave of absence. After years of being yelled at and made to feel ashamed and ugly and hideous, to have Kevin McKenzie tell me that it was okay and that it didn't mean that I wasn't a valuable dancer. It just meant that I had a disease that I needed to heal, and he was willing to wait for me. I have learned not to tell somebody to just lose weight, but you do need to address this and you need some professional help with it. It may be something as simple as you not understanding what to eat. I'm telling you this on the same level that if you were walking in here with chronic tendonitis, I would eventually say, you have to go to the physical therapist and take care of this and equate it on that level and give them the name of the doctor and send them off. So how did tour go? It was okay. A former dancer herself, Dr. Linda Hamilton, understands the extremes to which a dancer will go. They're so phobic about fat at this point. Well, by the time I get them, they've maybe not been eating fat for five years. What is always so wonderful is when I get them to eat enough calories and fat, and suddenly their bodies start working again, their metabolism speeds up, they start to lose weight, and they look at me in amazement like, come on, this is working. I think, are you ready? Mm -hmm. get, your, get your weight check. Mm -hmm. Let's go. My weight dropped. I mean, I lost, I think, like five pounds within the first two weeks or something just by eating fat, by having 30 grams of fat a day. It was the most amazing thing. I would have never believed it if somebody had told me that. <laughs> Alina is back with the company now, rehearsing a soloist part for a 60th anniversary presentation of Swan Lake. 
I think getting the support has helped on a level that she's happier. She enjoys her dancing. And if she can be guided properly and, and then really fully realize her talent, the potential is there to be wonderful. It's to be absolutely wonderful. After leaving her life as a supermodel, Kate Dillon spent the next two years searching for a new career to fit the person she has become. I wanted freedom from this, this ideal, from these cultural ideals. I wanted freedom to be who I was, whatever that would be. If I was the biggest dork in the world, well, then that was going to have to be okay. And if I was a big mess, then that was going to have to be okay, too. And if I was beautiful, that would be fine. And if I was ugly, that would be fine. But that I didn't want to fight myself anymore, that I really wanted to just, like, unzip this suit that I'd been wearing of, like, like me, like me, like me, uh, think I'm interesting, I want to be perfect, and just take it off and just expose and just be like, I'm just who I am. No longer at war with her body, Kate has settled into a comfortable weight and a new career in modeling. Plus size is no different than skinny. It's just, it's just another way of being beautiful. Many of these girls have been struggling with their bodies their whole life, and suddenly they're being told that they're beautiful. So when you get 25 women up on stage it, with curvy, beautiful bodies, walking around feeling beautiful, it's infectious. And everybody is sort of drunk with that. And when I think about the impact it could have on a young girl like me, maybe, who is 12 years old and, and, and isn't going to fit into the right size and isn't going to fit into that mold, and she is going to grow up in a world where things like that exist, maybe she's not going to feel so bad about herself. Back at the DePaul Tulane Eating Disorders Unit, Erin is preparing to leave. On the right track, she will have to continue treatment at home for at least another year or two to ensure a full recovery. Well, we have Erin being discharged Friday. Okay. The best insurance to prevent relapse is continued care in all dimensions of treatment. With her aftercare plan set with a good therapist, a good nutritionist, and an excellent family therapist, with all of that in place and these people pursuing health with Erin and her family, her chances are far better. Dear treatment team, I just want to tell you all thank you so much for what you have done for me. I know that I can need and ask for help and assert myself because of you all. I know that there will be rainy days ahead of me and I'm ready to fight them. You have helped me so much even though I sometimes got pissed off. If I ever need help again, I will come to you all because I trust and believe that you can make miracles really made some great strides forward and you just have to keep up the good work and you have to keep up with your therapies all of them mm -hmm. and start to enjoy a real life because I think it's all out there for you mm -hmm. okay you ready for it yeah. okay I'm so proud of you everyone has given me an opportunity to a new life and I thank you for that thank you for being my family I love you all and I'm starting on my journey now love always Aaron Go to Nova Online for more information on eating disorders, including a helpline, how to seek treatment, and other resources. Log on to PBS.org or America Online keyword PBS. Educators can order this or any other NOVA program for $19.95 plus shipping and handling. Call WGBH Boston Video at 1-800-255-9424. Next time on NOVA. In Japan, a ritual of fire and floods signals an incredible transformation. NOVA's cameras take you in for a rare look at Japan's secret garden.
Nova is a production of WGBH Boston.